Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. Join us as we get to know some of the people, places, and experiences that make the Golden State such a unique destination. Today, travel and leisure editor-in-chief Nathan Lump gets behind the wheel and takes us on a road trip across the Anderson Valley, past soaring redwoods, eventually arriving on the majestic Mendocino Coast. Getting in a car and driving is, is such a wonderful way to not only experience the landscape of a place, but to give yourself the freedom to stop and, you know, do the unexpected. And Pauline Fromer shares some of her favorite family-friendly destinations. The veteran travel author and radio host is a big believer in traveling with her children. Well, when you're a family, you want to have that time together. I can't imagine traveling without my kids. And frankly, I think it's made them better human beings. There's nothing like travel for families. I think it's a great thing to do. Plus, we'll talk with Fred Schruers, a longtime correspondent for Rolling Stone magazine, who reveals his five favorite music venues in Los Angeles. It's all coming up on California Now. You are listening to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. Today, we're delighted to welcome Nathan Lump to the California Now podcast. Nathan is travel industry royalty. In addition to his role as editor-in-chief of Travel and Leisure, the largest editorial travel brand in the U.S., he's the editorial director of Meredith Corporation's luxury titles, including Departures and Food and Wine. Nathan is a true globetrotter and has numerous awards in his trophy case. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Nathan. Thanks, Satirius. It's great to be with you. Okay, so when I'm looking for some travel-related inspiration, I often turn to your publication, Travel and Leisure. I I understand you did the same thing uh, for your recent road trip in Mendocino County. That's absolutely right. You know, it's a it's a wonderful thing when you uh, read something in your own magazine and it makes you want to uh, makes you want to go somewhere. But we actually we did a piece in the uh, in the June issue of Travel and Leisure about Anderson Valley, uh, the inland part of Mendocino County, and I'd never been there. And I was um, going to be in Napa for um, for a birthday celebration, and so I said to my husband, like, you know, let's let's get in the car and drive up there because it's a part of California I've never experienced before, and it sounds really really awesome. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the perfect little road trip. Um, and speaking of road trips, it seems like the entire category is having a moment right now. Why do you think road trips seem so appealing these days? You know, I think I think people like the idea of slowing down a little bit and kind of immersing themselves in places that, you know, getting in a car and driving is, is such a wonderful way to not only experience the landscape of a place, but to give yourself the freedom to stop and, you know, do the unexpected because you're always coming upon things uh, when you drive. And so um, I think that I think that is really appealing to people. I think it, it allows them to kind of feel like they're having an experience that's more authentic and uh, more rooted in in what's local and in, you know, in, in, in communities. Uh, I think so that's that's one of the things I love about doing it. And, you know, it's a we in fact on our on our trip we drove up from um calistoga we took 128 out of calistoga up towards um up towards mendocino and had one of those serendipitous moments where we found ourselves at a certain point where we were hungry for lunch and we weren't quite where exactly where we thought we were going to be at that moment um because we left a little bit later and um so we did this detour we up went up on highway 101 we got off the 128 and um, went to Hoplin, which is not necessarily a notable thing, but when we were going back then to um, to get into Anderson Valley, because we took that detour, we ended up on this little road called Mountain House Road that took us back to the 128, and that road was unbelievably beautiful. Um, it was kind of winding through the you know the hills and dales of Anderson Valley, surrounded by agricultural land, and it was just a it was such a treat. And we never would have been on that road if we hadn't made that detour. If you don't mind, I'd like to climb into the passenger seat and, and join you on a recap of the journey. Let's rewind. Where did you start? What was the plan? So our plan was basically to um, leave Napa, drive up um, into Mendocino County. Um, have a night in Anderson Valley, so sort of two days, one night um, in Anderson Valley, and then continue on to the coast. Um, and that's so that's what we ended up doing. So we drove out of Calistoga on 128 and um, ended up in Anderson Valley. And the, the great thing is once you hit Yorkville, you basically start to get into the wine country aspect of Anderson Valley. And, you know, Anderson Valley, if you haven't been there, is like, you know, people, you know, people often say Sonoma's like, 
Napa 20 years ago. You know, Anderson Valley is really like Sonoma 20 years ago. Wow. It's, um, you know, it feels really, feels really agricultural, um, super kind of local. When you go into a tasting room, you're often, you know, tasting with the winemaker um, or the owner of the, of, of the vineyard or winery. Um, and everybody's like, you know, it's it's super chill and friendly and people give you um, more ideas of other places to go. Like the first place we stopped on the way in on 128 was a place called Yorkville Cellars, which is basically the first one you come to. Mm. And um, and the guy who owns it, who's there doing the tasting, you know, he knows your he knows that he's probably your first stop. And so one of the things he does when you're done with your tasting is he pulls out the map and goes through all of the wineries in Anderson Valley with you and, you know, gives you his recommendations. And it's such a such a nice experience. To, you know, it feels um, you know, it's really warm and, um, and actually really helpful. Um, another one of the places that we stopped after that was um another place called Penny Royal Farm, which is uh, a winery, but also a working farm. And they raise goats and (laughs) uh, make their own cheese. And so one of the things that's awesome there is that you can do a wine and cheese um, pairing kind of tasting, which is such a nice um, experience to to have the wine with some food. And their cheeses are really awesome. Um, So that was a great, that was a great place. And then we um, stopped in Boonville, which is one of the little towns like, adorable little town um you know got some ice cream at a place called Paisan and um there's a wonderful store there called Farmhouse Mercantile which is like the um most attractive uh kind of hardware store you'll ever see in your life (laughs) um and then um and then we ended up staying the night at um a place called the Madrones which is a kind of a it's a little kind of complex of mediterranean style buildings complex makes it sound larger than it actually is but um it's basically a b&b and it's um super super cute um the guys who run it are you know are on site and they've got and one of the nice things there is that in addition to the rooms and they only have a handful they um they have some extra space that they rent out to other people so they actually have a couple tasting rooms um on site and their own shop which is really wonderfully curated with lots of um great stuff for the home it's so amazing to be able to, you know, have access to the amazing wine and food. And then on top of that, to have that personal touch uh, from the people who you meet. Yeah. You know, and that's the great thing about these kinds of destinations, I think, is that, you know, because they're not wildly commercialized and super heavily touristed, you just, you know, people have a little bit more time and they're on hand and they're really excited that you're there. You know, we went for dinner that night to a restaurant called The Bewildered Pig, um, which is in Philo, which is turned out to be, we did a tasting menu, you know, it's it's run by a husband and wife team. Um, you know, he's in the front of the house working the, you know, working the room, she's in the kitchen cooking and, um, and the food is so memorable. It's really some of the best food I've had in a long time um you know i still think about a dish that we had on that tasting menu which was so incredibly simple it was a grilled white peach with um homemade uh, herb ricotta cheese some prosciutto um foraged greens and some tangerine oil uh, hmm. drizzled on top and you know all those ingredients are super simple but put together you know they were all so fresh and put together just kind of created this you know, just magic on the plate. It's pretty amazing that you can remember so vividly the experience and or, you know, a meal that you had weeks and months later. That says a lot. Yeah, no, it's, you know, when you've got those things that really kind of touch you in a way, you, you know, you really do remember them. I mean, I, as we, when we were leaving Anderson Valley and we did a couple other great stops, we went to a wonderful, a couple great vineyards, Golden Eye, Phillips Hill, some really um, good ones. But uh, stopping on the way out as we were driving towards the coast, um, we stopped into Hendy Woods uh, State Park, which, you know, is an incredible redwood grove. Um, And the amazing thing, of course, is that you, you know, you drive in and you park and you're, you know, less than a five minute walk in You're you know, you're among the redwoods. And, you know, anyone who's spent time in redwood groves knows i mean it they're they're just majestic majestic trees right. and um you know and it's a it's a it's a really um almost spiritual experience you know the the japanese have coined their forest bathing um idea and you know i think there is something to it there's something very um life affirming and life giving about a a walk you know in in such a in such a beautiful place you almost feel like you're in an ancient church 
Totally. No, I mean, that's really, that is really how it, um, how it feels for me. And, you know, and the thing is when you, when you drive out of Anderson Valley towards the coast, I mean, you're also highway 128, if that's how you go, basically runs through Redwood Grove. So you also, you know, you, you get to drive through it as well, which is, um, gotta be one of the most picturesque driving experiences, um, I've ever had um and the road is beautifully maintained and all that it's like just um um it's kind of perfect and you know so you you have this wonderful winding drive through the forest and then when you pop out you're basically at the sea and it's not that long a drive um and and then suddenly you've got this majestic coastline in front of you um and the the sort of juxtaposition of those two things is um is really powerful and exactly kind of what makes for a great a great road trip in my opinion <laughs> having that kind of um having that kind of dramatic shift is um is really exciting um so that was really fun and then you know we we drove actually down um we drove south a bit from from where 128 pops out at the sea and drove down to a a new hotel um on the coast called the called the Harbor House Inn and um it just opened like a couple months ago, um, and it's uh, it's a it's been around for a long time, but under you know different owners, it's had different incarnations over the years. And in fact, I, I met another guest while we were there that um, had uh, they were celebrating their fiftieth wedding anniversary, and they had been there for their um, I think it was their honeymoon, um, and so they were they were back um, you know to experience it in its uh, in its new life. And basically, the owners have completely redone it and um, made it very very comfortable and attractive but the um one of the amazing things about it is that you just have this astounding view i mean you're you know you're perched high on the on the cliff and there are the rocks out in the sea and it's just like it's a little bit hard for me to describe if you go online you can take you can look at pictures it's i mean it's (laughs) one of the most dramatic hotel room views i've had in a long time um and um and it's it's being sort of operated by a young couple who um you know, are new to the business really. Um, he's a chef and, um, she worked in, I think in marketing or sales and, and, um, you know, and they're, they're doing that thing that people sometimes dream about doing, you know, changing up their lives and running an inn. And, right. Um, he does super ambitious food. Um, they do like, it's like a 10 course tasting menu and he uses a lot of foraged ingredients from the sea, like, you know, seaweed and sea lettuce and, um, you know, um, uh, lots of stuff from the you know that grows around there and it's just it's a really interesting experience but there's you know there's good food um you know throughout both certainly in Anderson Valley there's great food but also on the coast you know lots of great places one one thing we did one day when we drove up into Mendocino um Mendocino town um which is adorable um have you ever been there Soterios I actually have not haven't made it up there yet so we had a great dinner in Mendocino um at um, a place called Cafe Beaujolais, which is in a, a little house, basically, and you feel like you're essentially like you know having dinner in in the living room. Um, just great. The chef does really um, does really interesting stuff. We had a, a um, actually a, a dish that had Mexican influence in it with a um, with a mole sauce actually, but it wasn't really a Mexican dish, um, but brought in those kind of flavors into the flavors of of, of, of mole into the um, into the dish. Just like really interesting. You know, you've got a lot of got a lot of chefs who are trying to you know make food that's both really satisfying but also you know quite interesting and taking advantage of both the wide range of influences that you have in California but also just the incredible produce that you have at hand I mean you know up there you know it's still Mendocino is still quite agricultural and so you just the 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 bounty um you know that you have there you know everything from fresh dairy to you know to fruit and veg is is really pretty extraordinary well i mean you know great wine interesting restaurants natural beauty the lure of the open road it it sounds like your mendocino county road trip checked a lot of boxes it it really did i mean you know i i i'm I'm gushing a little bit but i mean seriously it was a it was a um it was a really wonderful trip and like you know it the slowing down aspect of, 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 of going to a place like that, that's, you know, um, not too busy and not too commercial and where you just like, you know, you really feel like you can just be and enjoy and see and sample and, um, you know, and the vibe is really laid back. It's just, it's a really, I think it's really, um, you know, for those of us who 
live um, quite busy lives, um, it's a really it's a really nice um, change of pace. Um, and that's, I think, for me, was also one of the real highlights of that trip. Sounds dreamy. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Nathan. Yeah. Thank you, Soterius. Great to be here. Nathan Lump was named Editor of the Year by Media Industry Newsletter in 2017. Last year, his magazine Travel and Leisure was named Hottest Travel Magazine by Adweek. In addition to these and other accolades, Nathan has helped expand Travel and Leisure's social media footprint. It now has more than 12 million followers. You can find links and more information about the places we discussed today at visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. You're listening to the California Now podcast. I'm Satirius Johnson. Guns N' Roses, The Doors, The Carpenters, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, The Eagles, Metallica, X, The Birds, the list goes on and on. So many influential musicians and bands got their start in Los Angeles, and as a result, the City of Angels has an embarrassment of riches when it comes to live music venues. For this lightning round, we've asked longtime Rolling Stone correspondent Fred Truers to share his top five music venues in L.A. Fred, welcome to the California Now podcast. Thanks. Pleasure to join you. You know, L.A. has a reputation for being a great town for live music. Is that reputation deserved? Oh, most certainly so. Live music and sometimes outdoors live music, though. Uh, I'm certainly a fan of the, you know, claustrophobic little club, too. <laughs> I imagine it's a bit like New York City. I mean, every artist has to conquer L.A. if they plan on making it in the music business. Absolutely so. You know, it's just, uh, I'm remembering... Uh, so many times where you just look around in the crowd and, and go, oh, my God, it's Sly Stallone <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know, name your star. And unfortunately, in recent years, some of them think they're meant to get on stage with the guitar. That doesn't always work <laughs> out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, bless their hearts. Uh, it's the, the excitement of L.A. music scene is indisputable. Let's get right to your top five list of music venues in L.A. And remember, this is a lightning round, so we're going to blast through these pretty quickly. So what comes in at number five and why? I had to include the Greek theater. Uh, I recently uh, saw Ryan Adams there, and at the end, he and the band said, we played the Greek in disbelief. I'm going to go <laughs> review Brandy Carlisle, a great favorite of mine there soon. There's a tour called the LSD Tour with Lucinda, Steve, and Dwight. I won't bother to name check those further. You could see the Decemberists, Gypsy Kings, Jackson Brown, Ringo Starr, Arcade Fire. It's just a crazy, cool outdoor place that seats 6,000 of you, and therefore it's kind of intimate. The city runs it. It's got terrific acoustics. And a Polestar magazine called it the best small outdoor venue around. Oh, wow, amazing. So oh, yeah, number four, what's number four? The Whiskey, you know, an intimate, smoky beer spattered little place on sunset boulevard which is an essential part of everybody's rock and roll education it was named hmm. after a famous paris club uh, that was founded in 47 this the whiskey was founded in in 64 so, so just some little no account bands like the birds buffalo springfield the doors you know i i've seen showcases there and it again at uh how many 500 seats it feels pretty intimate sometimes right. you can't even you know get to the bar all right what about number three the roxy you know roxy is another one of those classic names i can picture the neon on sunset you know strip in my mind right now upstairs is the club on the rocks where you might see some rock stars again similar to the whiskey capacity of 500 tiny bit claustrophobic so let me just name three people who have had live albums there that are, again, pretty estimable. Neil Young, uh, with Crazy Horse, basically. Bob Marley, yeah, we know him. <laughs> Warren Zevon, the Warren Zevon Stand in the Fire album. I, I was there for some of that, or at least I've seen Warren there. And, uh, you know, you can't beat the Roxy for immersion in rock and roll, L.A. culture. You all remember the era of the hair bands, of which... You know, Guns N' Roses was basically the, the chief exponent. But, uh, I don't know, Poison, Rat, Slayer, probably all of those bands have been through the Roxy. So that's not to be missed if you find yourself on Sunset Strip or take yourself to Sunset Strip. To be in such a kind of intimate place with these, these great bands sounds amazing. All right, which venue lands in second place and why? Second place 
it was not an easy pick because I was running out of votes. But the Wiltern, <laughs> which is named because it's at the intersection of Western and Wilshire in L.A., uh, kind of next to Koreatown. When I go to the Wiltern, it reminds me of the old days being on the road, maybe for Rolling Stone, and going to some classic deco theater in Indianapolis or something. And Bruce Springsteen's playing there tonight, though I've not seen him at the Wiltern. And uh, what you see is, you see girls like you used to see in the 60s. For you youngsters, you'll have to imagine that. Uh, <laughs> in buckskin and paisley. And I'm not saying you see bell bottoms, but it's the feel of the old rock and roll vibe that, you know, you just, people are costumed like Neil Young still is. So I would say the Wiltern is a place to get the classic, essential rock and roll hippie vibe and acoustically pretty flawless. A nice old grand theater. Again, 1,850 people. There's a sense of intimacy there. That sounds really amazing. And drum roll, please. What's your number one music venue in Los Angeles? I'd have to say it's the Mighty Troubadour. And by that, I mean Mighty Small. What Really, 500 seats. But it's the intimacy that really sells the Troubadour to me. It's in West Hollywood, which is, you know, a well-tracked tourist destination. There's a lot of great hotels nearby, a lot of great bars at rock and rollish bars. But the Troubadour has seen so many classic performers. Again, my needle sometimes gets stuck on things Billy Joel because I wrote about him. But the gigs he played there were just career-making gigs in, in many regards. So you'll find a lot of loyalty to the Troubadour, to the people who uh, played it and made it a classic venue. And again, intimacy is the keynote. It's well worth a trip. Regardless of the size of the band, you're seeing a little patch of history right there in West Hollywood. Well, that's quite a countdown, Fred. Thanks for sharing your top five on California Now. My pleasure. Fred Shores is a veteran correspondent for Rolling Stone, Entertainment Weekly, and the LA Times, as well as other outlets. He's also a podcaster and the author of the definitive biography of rock and roll Hall of Famer Billy Joel. You can find links to Fred's top five LA music venues on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. Remember, you'll always find links to all the people and places we mention on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. You're listening to California Now. Traveling with Children presents special pleasures and challenges, and my guest today is uniquely qualified to share her insights on the subject. Pauline Fromer is co-president of the family business started by her father, Arthur Fromer, in the 1950s, his guide, Europe on $5 a Day, helped define travel for a generation in post-war America. And Fromer's has gone on to publish hundreds of guides in print and online. Pauline Fromer hosts two radio programs, one with her father, who's now 88 years old. Welcome to the California Now podcast, Pauline. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, you know, given your parents' work on travel guides, I'm guessing that your experience with family travel began when you were very young? Oh, yes. I was uh, four months old when I took my first trip to Europe. Uh, so uh, it was it was before the time of disposable diapers, which wasn't easy, and they didn't have porta cribs then. So my parents would simply put me into a dresser drawer for the night, and that's where I'd sleep. <laughs> and I, I, I've, I've heard that, that your father's advice in the 50s was, don't bring your kids with you. Is that right? His advice today is don't bring your kids with you. I think he looks back and thinks that I destroyed his vacations. Uh, he always recounts that I was good as gold in the cheap restaurants, but whenever they decided to have a splurge, that's when I would throw a massive tantrum. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, as kids are, are want to do, I mean, how, how have you embraced family travel with your own family now? Well, when you're a family, you want to have that time together. I can't imagine traveling without my kids. And frankly, I think it's made them better human beings. Uh, they have an understanding that the world is different than it is in their own backyard. Uh, but and, and they have an understanding of, of how humans have many commonalities as well. Uh, I think it's the best education you can give your kids. And it's wonderful to be able to see them and for them to see you in so many different contexts. It's, there's nothing like travel for families. I think it's a great thing to do. Well, your kids are teenagers now, but uh, what tips do you have for traveling with, say, infants and toddlers? 
Well, with infants and toddlers, my main tip is you don't have to worry about them. So many parents feel like they have to plan kid-friendly vacations when their kids are still toddlers and babies. And the truth is, they'll be happy wherever you go, as long as you give them a little time to run around, to be babies and toddlers, they're gonna be fine. It always breaks my heart when I see parents going to quote-unquote kiddie destinations with real little ones. You can do that later when they'll be more interested. Right now, don't be shy about about going to a museum. If they start fussing, you can duck out for a moment. Uh, Don't be shy about going anywhere with them. So what about teenagers? What are some tips for traveling with, with your teens? Well, you definitely have to take their interests into account when you're traveling, when you're planning a trip. In fact, I would say let them do some of the planning. Give them a guidebook. Send them on the internet. Let them choose maybe activities for one or two days. And that way, hopefully, they'll be more patient when your day comes. Uh, As well, it's a great opportunity to teach kids how to budget. Uh, I give my teens a set amount of money that they're allowed to spend in the course of the trip so that they're not always pulling on my sleeve and saying, can I get this? Can I get that? And and they become very frugal, actually. (laughs) They usually don't. Don't spend it until the end of the trip. And there have been a couple of trips where they didn't actually spend what they were supposed to spend on the trip just because they kept saving it and saving it. But it's a good lesson. That's great. So how do you rate California as a family travel destination? I think California is an awe-inspiring travel destination. I mean, it has everything. It has great natural sites. It has fascinating history. It's a very cosmopolitan state. You're going to meet people from all over the world who have settled in California. And in some places, you're going to see bits and pieces of their culture. I was just in uh, Los Angeles recently, and I went to Oliveira Street, which is this adorable little street in downtown LA that looks like something out of the movie Coco uh, because it's all of these stalls and little restaurants and people are strolling up and down and there are Day of the Dead statuettes and you just feel like you've been transported to Mexico. It's really magical. That's really great. So what are some of your other, say, top uh, favorite destinations in California for family travel? Well, I think taking a road trip down the California coast is a must. Uh, The kids will love the barking sea lions in St. Simeon. They'll love seeing Hearst Castle. I think that impresses people of all ages that somebody could actually live like that when you learn the stories behind it. Uh, Going to the Monterey Aquarium, one of the best aquariums on the planet. Absolutely. uh, Because it's so so well integrated uh, into the coastline. It's so different than other aquariums. You know, you you go outside and there's the sea, and yet it's still part of the aquarium. It's it's a, a really wonderful place. I've actually driven down the uh, the Pacific Coast Highway myself, and it's really just gorgeous and striking. And there's so 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 many really great places to stop off at on the way, uh, whether it's in Big Sur or at Hearst Castle or at Monterey. Um, it's really a, an amazing uh, road trip, especially with a family. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's there's quirky things to see and do. Uh, you can go to the Madonna Inn, oh. uh, which is this fabulous 1950s inn where every single room has a different theme to it. Uh, I stayed in the Indian room, which I thought was going to be India, but this is 1950s America, so it was actually <laughs> Native American. And half of it looked like a cave, and half of it f- was filled with these wacky paintings of uh, Native Americans in massive headdresses. And I was transported back to the past and then you eat in this all pink dining room and it's it's just a hoot oh it's hilarious i actually stopped there um a couple of years ago didn't stay over but just had a ball uh having a drink at the bar and uh just taking in the scenery yeah. there was like some sort of uh dance party going on where they were kind of ballroom dancing it was hilarious it was really great They were ballroom dancing when I was there, too. Uh, (laughs) And I was told one of the couples actually travels two hours just to ballroom dance there on Tuesday nights, I think it is. And one of the fun things to do is when you go there is actually to go into the bathroom. Uh, If you're a woman, you have to sneak into the men's room because it's a waterfall (laughs) that appears (laughs) uh, when men do their business. Uh, And I think kids find that hilarious, and so do adults. (laughs) What about... um... San Diego. Uh, San Diego is a really great place for families, I think. 
yeah, it's kind of amazing that San Diego is a place where people live and work. Uh, because it feels like this pleasure palace, uh, especially when you're in Balboa Park. And that, you know, that really was built in that way. It, I think it was in around 1909, the Panama Canal was about to be finished, and San Diego wanted to have a World's Fair to celebrate that event. Uh, but they were competing with San Francisco, but through a whole series of machinations, I think they got the president of the United States at that time to come down on the side of San Diego, even though it was this much smaller city. And they built Balboa Park, which is a really unusual urban development. It's it's all of these Spanish colonial and Moorish type structures in this beautiful parkland. And it's museum after museum after museum. It's this extraordinary development that the city created uh, for the World's Fair that has had this afterlife that made San Diego a major destination for tourism. So, so if you were to... to recommend, say, you know, uh, uh, an excursion to San Diego for a family, what would be kind of like a really great itinerary? Well, you'd probably want to spend at least four days there. You're going to want to spend at least half of the day at the San Diego Zoo, uh, because it's one of the greatest zoos in the world, not just the United States. Uh, And then uh, you'll want to uh, do some stuff in downtown San Diego, Uh, You're going to want to spend some time in the harbor uh, touring the USS Midway, which is a decommissioned naval vessel uh, that's absolutely fascinating. One of the great things that they've done is they have a lot of former naval officers aboard leading the tours and telling you what it was like to live in this kind of beehive-like warren of, of little cramped rooms where most of the sailors were and what their daily duties were like. And uh, it's just an absolutely fascinating thing uh, for, for anybody eight and older, I would say. Uh, you're going to want to spend a day in La Jolla, uh, not only going to the wonderful beaches there, but there are terrific seafood restaurants. There are other museums to see. And I think one of the best uh, playhouses in the country, uh, the La Jolla Playhouse has sent Uh, half a dozen shows to Broadway in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, So you're always going to see something great there. They also have good children's theater. Uh, So, And then maybe a day exploring uh, the Gas Lamp District, shopping at the the various boutiques downtown. Uh, There's just so much to see and do in San Diego. You know, know, one advantage of traveling with kids must be meeting other parents, whether in California or around the world, I'm, I'm guessing parenting is, is a kind of universal language. Yeah. You know, people always say that they want to have an authentic vacation. And I think that you're forced into authenticity when you have kids with you uh, for a couple of reasons. They need time to blow off steam. And so you're going to spend some of your time just in parks and playgrounds where other parents are, usually local parents, and you're going to meet people that people who are traveling without children probably would never get a chance to sit down and chat with just because you have time on your hands. You're watching the kids (laughs) play and you schmooze and it's wonderful and it's a really great way to get a sense of the destination as well kids have needs. So you're probably going to end up paying for that darn expensive restaurant meal and then having to go to a grocery store because your kid didn't eat any of it. Mm-hmm. And you get to see what a local grocery store looks like. <laughs> you can try and look on the bright side in that, in that case. Uh, as well, kids notice things that adults don't. Uh, and they, they may get fascinated by the fact that a, a uh, street lamp looks different in the city you're visiting than it does at home. And you'll stop and you'll notice it with them. And it makes the vacation deeper and richer. Pauline Fromer is co-president of Fromer's LLC and hosts a radio show with her father, Arthur Fromer, the creator of the legendary Europe on $5 a day. Thanks so much, Pauline. I hope you'll join us again on the California Now podcast. I would love to. This was a lot of fun. As always, you'll find links to all the places we've discussed on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. Thank you for listening to California Now. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Please subscribe.
Pauline Fromer mentioned today that San Diego County is one of her favorite kid-friendly destinations, and she has a point. The southwest corner of California boasts the San Diego Zoo and San Diego Zoo Safari Park, Legoland California, Balboa Park, and much more. For more family-friendly travel ideas, check out the Adventures in Kidifornia video series. The first three episodes showcase SeaWorld San Diego, the USS Midway Museum, and Cabrillo National Monument. You can find these videos online at visitcalifornia.com slash dream365tv.